Greetings, Director Robert Gish, recording a meeting for the IGH and my sister Hong Dao for your wonderful December meeting on fatty liver. I'll be talking today about Maffold, MASH, NASH, name change, state of the art, how to manage today fatty liver, and what's coming next. The disclosures for my program are on this website. I also encourage you to sign up for my newsletter and if you wish to be added to my listservs, specifically listservs on fatty liver. We have a disturbing evolutionary development taking place. We've gone from four legs to two legs, walking, developed a very sophisticated society, and now we have a decline in our overall survival due to metabolic issues, metabolic syndrome, fatty liver, increasing cardiovascular risk and cancer risk. Let's talk more about that. A paradigm shift has taken place over the last 20 years where individuals being overweight and having obesity are now responsible for more deaths than malnutrition. We live in a global toxic food environment. Families have shifted their influence on eating habits and healthy food choices to unhealthy food choices. We have worksite vending machines that cater to an unhealthy food habit. School cafeterias have switched from healthy to unhealthy food choices. Many neighborhoods have less access to healthy foods. Marketing of junk food and unhealthy foods specifically to children have taken place. Regulations have changed where the price of healthy foods have risen, while the prices of sugary and processed foods have declined. Societal norms about obesity and being overweight have changed. Let's talk about fatty liver terms. In the past, we called this NAFL, NAFLD, NASH. Over the last 10 years, nomenclatures have changed. In the Asia Pacific region, with over 70 countries, we have adopted the term metabolic associated fatty liver disease. In Europe, North America, and South America, the name change that was completed recently to MASLD, M A S L D, metabolic associated steatotic liver disease, and MET A L D, metabolic and alcohol associated liver disease. They tried to remove the word fatty, and that's where we came up with muscle. But every time you explain steatosis or steatotic, you have to use the word fat or fatty liver disease. And of course, we have lean muscled or mean nasled, muscled. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Steatosis and steatotic is a fatty change. Hepatitis in this case means inflammation. And now we have alcohol-associated liver disease, alcohol use disorder, alcohol-related or alcohol-associated hepatitis. It's best to be using these current terms. Here we talk about MAFLD and where we have hepatic steatosis, whether people are overweight, obese, lean, normal, and the presence or absence of diabetes. In an individual with fatty liver, but without diabetes, it's very important to be looking at waist circumference, hypertension, plasma triglycerides, HDL and LDL cholesterol, and whether they have prediabetes. It's rare that we're checking HOMA IR or insulin resistance scores, but that can be added in. And it's important to be look at C-peptide and also C-reactive protein. In the end, after putting together these different scoring systems, you can come up with a final diagnosis of MAFLD. Steatosis is more than 5% of hepatocytes being occupied or replaced by fat, no significant alcohol consumption. And it's very important to be thinking about this new terminology as you communicate to patients. They may be aware of these new terms. Now we're moving to masseled steatotic liver disease, metabolic associated steatotic liver disease. And there's more detail here about MET-ALD and the amount of alcohol consumed 
over a day or over a week. Of course, you can have drug-induced fatty liver disease, so take a thorough medication, herbal, and supplement history. And again, back to alcohol. If you can't take an accurate alcohol history, which is the case with many patients, be sure to obtain PETH, P-E-T-H, PETH testing, phosphatidyl inositol. And don't forget rare diseases such as Wilson disease or lysosomal acid lipase deficiency or hypobeta lipoproteinemia or other inborn errors in metabolism. Celiac disease and malnutrition can also lead to steatotic liver disease. So in summary, some key concepts here to guide your clinical practice. This is the massled world for the moment. You realize that liver enzymes are not liver function tests. AST and ALT are not LFTs. These are liver enzymes and can be normal in fatty liver disease. So if the ultrasound shows up fatty liver and the enzymes are less than 25 or 30, they still have fatty liver, but it's possible they have a lower risk of progression to fibrosis. Ultimately, you need to be scoring fibrosis with elastography. That's preferred. And of course, indirectly, you can talk about scoring fat, fibrosis, inflammation through APRI, FIB4. Uh, there's also the uh, scoring, the NASH scoring system. APRI and FIB4 are really pointing towards fibrosis using liver enzyme patterns and using platelet count. Platelet count is also very useful for scoring patients. A platelet count over 170,000 is likely mild fibrosis. Between 100 and 170,000, you're going to be F3, fibrosis 3 level, and below 100,000 for platelet count, it's highly likely they have cirrhosis. Ultrasound can be used to detect spleen size and portal vein diameter as part of this composite scoring system. And of course, you always get a CAP score. Rarely are you going to be scoring fat on an MRI. In these non-invasive tests, you're going to have stage zero to stage four. Stage zero is normal. Stage one portal expansion with some potential chicken wire. Stage two is extra portal fibrosis. Stage three bridging. And stage four cirrhosis where you have no central vein and a nodule that's surrounded by fibrous tissue. Outcomes are linked to fibrosis in general, although fatty liver indirectly is linked to cardiovascular scores, uh, importantly, and also cancer risk. When people have obesity or overweight, there's many different metabolic medical impacts. And every person with fatty liver, you need to look at the whole patient, sleep, cardiovascular, diabetes, orthopedic, gout, urinary tract, incontinence, infertility, gallstones, reactive airway, anxiety and depression, increased risk for COVID-19 or severity of COVID, and increased risk of 13 different cancers and decreased physical functioning. Here, we talk to our patients about these associations with overweight or obesity, but I flip this around and say, by losing weight, you can extend your life by X number of years. There's no safe amount of alcohol in fatty liver disease. This has been shown in a variety of different manuscripts. So I tell my patients not to drink alcohol until we have their fatty liver controlled. Fructose depletes hepatic ATP and is really a liver toxin, a mitochondrial toxin. So you want your patients only on natural fructose through fruit consumption, but no simple sugars, no junk food, no soft drinks. This needs to be banished from their diet. The intestinal microbiome also influences fat in the liver, inflammatory processes, muscle inflammation, muscle insulin resistance. So vegetarian diet, highly preferred, vegan okay with certain supplements such as B12, and a fish-based diet well above a beef or pork-based diet. Probiotics can also assist with managing fatty liver, and I place all my patients on probiotics. 
What about lean patients? This means patients with a normal BMI in general. You still are going to put those patients, if they have suspected fatty liver from elevated enzymes or imaging, you're going to score them through Fib4. And you may even consider ELF testing. Of course, you're going to do elastography and you're going to implement a weight loss program for those individuals. Refer to hepatology if they're stage two fibrosis or higher. There's a number of other scores such as FAST test, NIS4, MAST, MEFEB, corrected T1. But I want to keep this simple. Take home message today. Look at enzymes. Look at the enzyme pattern. FIB4, APRI, elastography, spleen size, portal vein diameter. Look at the platelet count. And if you have fibrosis level two or higher, it's time for a very aggressive intervention. Weight loss, meet with a nutritionist, vitamin E, 800 international units per day, aggressive management of diabetes with metformin, GLP-1, SGLT-2, and frequent follow-up every three to six months, imaging annually. Lean subjects is super important because they also have the risk for these terrible outcomes, cardiovascular, cancer, and liver disease. You need to be definitely moving forward with aggressive management if they have increased fibrosis. It is all about visceral adiposity more than other types of adiposity. The higher the visceral adipose tissue area, the higher the risk for simple, simple steatosis, NASH with fibrosis, and advancing fibrosis. Outcomes in fatty liver are linked to GGT levels. So every patient you have who's getting a liver panel, AST, ALT, alkaline phosphatase, GGT, those are the four key liver enzymes. Think of like a table or a chair. You need four legs. Liver function, it's going to be bilirubin, specifically direct bilirubin, albumin, and INR as a coagulation test. Back to staging, the simple seven listed here. Platelet count, AST to ALT ratio, higher than 0.8 is F3, higher or greater than 1.0 is F4. We mentioned all of the other factors here, such as spleen size, portal vein diameter, APRI, FIB4 and NAFL D score. You can go on to MD Calc website to do these calculations to make it simple. Liver stiffness is associated with outcome. And here we're talking about liver cancer and liver failure. Very important. Every patient with fatty liver needs a fibrosis score. We're not doing genetic testing yet in fatty liver, but in the lower right-hand corner are genetic modifiers of fibrosis that are available through some commercial labs, PNPLA3, TM6, MBOAT, HSD, KLF may be the most important in this group, but not quite ready for prime time in your clinical practice. Very important here to be thinking about other scoring systems besides FibroScan, which is a brand name, they use VCTE, Vibration Control Transient Elastography. There's many competitors with different types of point shear wave, 2D shear wave, 3D shear wave, and you can even go down the road of MR elastography. Very important to be thinking about these individuals also in terms of scoring their CAP test. So remember that with weight loss, you can affect all these different changes, such as hypertension, hyperglycemia, reactive airway, obstructive sleep apnea, improve their diabetes, decrease cardiovascular and cancer risk. Super important. Yes, surgical bypass can make huge changes, but we have newer therapies such as GLP-1, GIP agonists or triple agonists that are coming down it can result in up to 50, 60 kilos of weight loss. There's also endoscopic options for this gastric bypass procedure, but really pharmacotherapy and behavior therapy, including diet and lifestyle is key. There are other anti-obesity uh, <clears throat> anti medications. And of course, 
there's lots of argument with insurance companies about whether you're treating diabetes or weight loss and who's going to pay for one. My main point on this slide in Vietnam is not to use Orlistat. This is something that causes malabsorption, vitamin malabsorption. I don't think it has a role or purpose in managing our patients. And it's really the issue of metformin, GLP-1, dual, and eventually triple agonists, thinking about SGLT2 agents, seeing a nutritionist, behavior modification, weight loss contract. GLP-1s, interestingly, decrease the risk of adverse liver outcomes, including hepatic decompensation. These are in patients with cirrhosis. So not only are they safe, but they change outcomes. This is the landscape. This is slides about a year old, but I just wanna tell you there's many, many drugs in development. On the far right, intercept stroke Ocalaba was turned down by the FDA because he didn't think there was a fair safety uh, ratio or safety index or benefit risk index. So even though it had good antifibrotic effects, it was declined by the US FDA. It's still being used for PBC. Of course, semiglutide has been around, liraglutide, but has never met the threshold of clinically significant improvement in fibrosis. But now we have two phase two studies in New England, New England Journal of Medicine with uh, servivdutide and also um, Monjuro, or that uh, combo therapy also under the brand name of Zepbound, that did reach in phase two studies improvement in fibrosis and fatty liver. But we must await for phase three studies for these important agents before moving them to first line. Salaldapar was stopped, but is approved for PVC, interestingly. Resmeteron in the middle is approved by the US FDA and being used for fatty liver off phase three data, the Maestro studies, and Maestro cirrhosis study will also be out hopefully in this fall with more data and data beyond 48 weeks. So resmeteron is really now the standard of care for managing fatty liver from a pharmacologic perspective. Aldeferman, lanafibrinor, fruxaferman, are also in the phase three development, and I'm very excited by findings with these important drugs. Terzepatide is a GIP GLP agonist sold under the name of Zepbound or Monjuro. This dual agonist did reach in phase two studies resolution of MASH, no worsening of fibrosis, and on the right side, decrease of one stage or more of fibrosis, no worsening of MASH. So wait for phase three, but this is very encouraging data with these dual agonists. Servidutide also reached these dual endpoints in phase two. Let's wait for phase three before fully embracing these dual agonists. Triple agonists, I mentioned before, Retidrutide also is showing signals and here is showing very profound weight loss with some patients having uh, over 30% body weight reduction at this 48 week interval. In summary, fatty liver is a systemic inflammatory process that affects every part of our body, our patient's body with cardiovascular risk number one, cancer risk number two, and liver risk number three. And I always like to list in that top four orthopedic issues for these patients. It's more prevalent in certain populations such as Hispanics in the Asia Pacific population, including Vietnam. Individuals, even with mild weight gain, with BMIs increasing from 22 to 24, can be associated with fatty liver and the attendant risk of cardiovascular cancer and liver. 16 gauge biopsy needles are used in research studies. Smoking and excess alcohol are bad. Coffee, tea, and sleep are good. Stop exposure to metabolic disruptors such as bisphenols, which are part of our plastic industry, and use motivational interviewing to find out what's driving their abnormal feeding behavior. Maffled, yes, weight loss of 10% is a great starting point. Exercising three hours per week with aerobic, yoga, and weightlifting. Statins are safe and effective for liver disorders, but don't affect fatty liver directly. Dietitian visits are necessary, I think, for all patients. Consider a weight loss contract such as that available on my website. 
vegetarian, fructose-free, Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean type diet is optimal. Lifestyle recommendations are highlighted here. And again, removing alcohol consumption until they resolve the fatty liver. Optimal care models means a multidisciplinary team engaging primary care, endocrinology, nutritionist, dietitian, gastroenterology, hepatology, cardiology, lipid management, and importantly, psychological management. I'd like to acknowledge all my wonderful partners in developing the slide deck and my teachers. I also want to thank Hong Dao and all the great work she's doing in Vietnam, the Asia Pacific, and globally. I look forward to working with you and visiting you next year. Thanks again for having me.